Ladies and gentlemen, it is my distinct honor to introduce tonight's guest of honor, the Assistant Commandant of the United States Marine Corps, General John Paxton. I have no idea what that music is either. Uh, JR, thanks for the gracious and overly long introduction. And ladies and gentlemen, it's an honor and a privilege to be with you this evening. Uh, I'm going to try and follow Jake's lead here and stay away from the table. I hope I'm half as good as you were, my friend, and not just in the words, but in the deeds. So well done, well done. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, the job tonight will surprise you. I want to bring just a uniform uh, perspective to character matters. And if not me, then who? No surprise. Uh, I am delighted to be here. I would be remiss if I didn't start the right way by thanking Janet and thanking Tom for the way you honor Travis, for the wheels that you put in motion with the organization here, and for the many, many volunteers and supporters who are here, Amy and everybody else. Uh, so first and foremost, I'd like those of us in uniform right now to give a round of applause for those who volunteer their time, their talent, to take care of growing leaders, uh, folks who have lost loved ones, and those who have opportunities in the future. So thank you all very, very much. Thank you. So ladies and gentlemen, I am indeed a native of Pennsylvania. More importantly, I'm a native of Philadelphia. So yeah, who uh, so. When we, work, when we root for football, we wear green and white and root for the Eagles, the I-G-G-L-E-S. So we don't do the Steelers, okay? Uh, and when we come back up here as good as the meal is, I still wish I was down in South Philly getting a cheesesteak. So uh, my wife has to remind me periodically to speak a little slower and that the glass on the table is full of water, W-A-T-E-R, instead of water. And, so, and we're good with that. So. But today, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to spend a few minutes to talk about Philadelphia first, about our nation second, about your United States Marine Corps third. And if you'll bear with me, and I know the secretary had to depart here, but it's about all the services, soldiers, sailors, airmen, Marines, Coasties, National Guard, officer enlisted, active or reserve, it doesn't matter. It's about those great Americans who wear the cloth of our nation and serve. And as I reminded a few earlier this evening, it doesn't matter war or peace. You raised your right hand, you took an oath, and you wrote a blank check to put it all on the line if you needed to do it. So I want to talk a little bit about those few in the proud, that one half of one percent who say, if not me, then who. But let's start in Philadelphia. I don't do jokes. As my wife will tell you, I either forget the punchline or it's inappropriate to the audience. But being a good, trained well by the gunny many years ago, you do have to have an attention gainer. And if you're not going to do a joke, you have to have a way to kind of get the crowd to focus with you. So I'd like to do a moment in history. And I'm fond of doing that because if you don't live history, you're doomed to repeat it. So tonight, this very night, in 1736, in the city of brotherly love, an aspiring printer who had run away from Boston and had yet to make his mark on the fledgling colonies of the world, got together with a couple friends, and Ben Franklin founded the first Union Volunteer Fire Department in Philadelphia. If not me, who? Taking care of fellow citizens. Taking care of, at the time, mates, colonial friends, long before they were American citizens. If not me, then who? Today, in 1979, the World Health Organization declared that the world was rid, eradicated, of the scourge of smallpox. Had taken 20 years to get vaccines around the world and to get people out into the places where Jake goes on a daily basis to give people options. Option number one is life. 20 years. It was people like Johnson & Johnson and the pharmaceuticals who came up with the vaccines. Again, if not me, who? So if you'll fast forward with me today, as a Marine, we always have special days in Marine history. It's easy in November, because the United States Marine Corps was born 240 years ago, this month in November. 
I know it's December now, but you'll have to forgive me. We celebrate our birthday a long time. <laughs> but the, the birthday of the Marine Corps is only about 16 blocks from here. It's down on 2nd in water, right along the water, in a place called Tum Tavern. Now, I know it'll surprise you that the Marine Corps was born in a bar. <laughs> it'll surprise you that we've been fighting ever since. I'm not sure whether we're fighting for who's going to pick up the tab or whatever, okay? But the Marine Corps is proud of its roots here in Philadelphia. And the Marine Corps has a long and storied tradition. And I'd like to talk a little bit about the Marine Corps. And if you'll bear with me, my battle buddies from the Army, my shipmates from the Navy, my wingmen from the Air Force, and everybody else. It's just because I'm going to use a few illustrative examples of, if not me, then who. So the United States Marine Corps, as I said, 240 years old, 240 years proud. But this week, the second week in December, in 1941, there were several hundred Marines that were trapped knowing they were going to die in a little place called Wake Island in the South Pacific. The previous Sunday, Pearl Harbor had been attacked. Thousands had been killed. Battleship Row was sunk, and the nation was reeling. There were several hundred Marines with Major Jimmy Devereaux on Wake Island fighting to survive. They had already repelled one Japanese attack. With a few anti-aircraft guns, a few aircraft, and some machine gunners, they had actually either stopped or sunk nine out of 13 ships that were trying to take Wake Island. And the news got back to mainland USA. And the Marines on the island and their corpsmen, their pharmacist mates, knew that if they could keep fighting and keep holding out, they'd send a message back to the mainland that we haven't lost everything, that our spirit's still there, that we got a way ahead. And indeed, they held out again for a second attack on the 23rd of December until they were all either captured or killed. Some of them became POWs for the rest of the war. Jimmy Devereaux survived the war, Medal of Honor recipient for his actions on Wake Island, retired as a brigadier general to a farm in Annapolis. But all of those defenders of Wake Island, to include one of our squadrons now, who are the Wake Island Avengers, live the motto, if not me, who? It was about stepping into the breach, about demonstrating initiative, and about demonstrating endurance. And the endurance and the fortitude was the character counts, the character matters. So much so that today, and my guess is out of those 500, we're probably down to single or low double digits of Wake Island veterans who may still be alive. But if you ever see them, you will know them immediately. If they're ever, and they're humble, humble men, but if they ever wear a uniform, you can look on their World War II campaign ribbon, and there's a W there. Since the Second World War, the only other devices we have on insignia are either stars, V's for valor, or oak leaf clusters. But that single unit from that single battle is authorized to wear a W. And you know you're looking at a Wake Island defender. Character, initiative, fortitude. If not me, who? A year later, many here are Marines, 1st Marine Division, Blue Diamond, one of our famous divisions. But a year later, the Blue Diamond is on Guadalcanal, and we still haven't won that first battle to turn the tide in the Second World War. But Major Alexander Archer Vandergrift in the Blue Diamond is on Guadalcanal, and they're trying to push back relentless attacks from the 7th of August until the 23rd of February. But this week, they start to hand over to the Army, to the 2nd Marine Division, because for the first four months, they've turned the tide. Despite horrendous casualties, Charlie 1-7, John Bazalone, great Marines, they've turned the tide of the Second World War. It's not the beginning of the end, but it's the end of the beginning. That was the high water mark. First Marine Division, if not me, then who? You fast forward six more years, and now the Army, RCT-31, the Marines, First Marine Division again, they're in Korea. Many of them think they were going to go to Kobe, Japan. The ships were redirected. They went down to Pusan. They spent five weeks in the Pusan perimeter, went down, around again, landed in Incheon, across the seawall at Blue Beach, along the Han River, into Seoul. And they've won three or four successive battles over the course of four or five months. But in early November, Douglas MacArthur brings them all the way around after the Incheon landing and puts them in Hamnung and Wansan on the northeast coast of Korea. And they're going to start the movement up to the Yalu River. They're going to turn the tide of the Korean conflict 
and they're going to bring everybody back home from Christmas. And there's pictures of the birthday ball with the 1st Marine Division in Ham Hung and Wonsan cutting a birthday cake in about 38 to 42 degree weather, shirt sleeves celebrating their birthday. Three weeks later, they were fighting for their life in 30 degrees below zero in old clothing, not against the North Koreans, but against eight Chinese communist divisions. If not me, then who? Now you could go on and I could go on, but I'll spare you for the rest of the night. My point is that be it the Marine Corps, be it the Army, be it the Navy, every generation, every generation since this great country was founded, there have been men and women who have said, if not me, then who? The reason we're here tonight is because the Travis Mannion Foundation recognizes their namesake, First Lieutenant Travis Mannion, who I had the honor and privilege of knowing in First Marine Division, who served nobly along with his classmate and battle buddy, Brendan Looney, another example of the next generation of, if not me, then who? I had the honor and privilege of looking out over the audience tonight, talk to some of the color guard from 314. We have a Navy lieutenant here. She graduated from the Naval Academy a year ago. She's going to be an S-60 pilot. We've got a Marine lieutenant here who's going to fly fixed wing. They're still here, the next generation. If not me, then who? So not by... Purely by accident, by happenstance, I had a couple quotes tonight, too. So Jake and I didn't rehearse this together. I don't want you to think we did that, okay? But I stole a couple from Teddy Roosevelt and a couple from Abraham Lincoln because we happen to be in this room. So Abraham Lincoln talked about the difference between reputation and character. He said, reputation is like the shadow, but the character is like the tree. People enjoy the shadow. People marvel in the shadow. People watch how long the shadow is cast. But it's the tree where the real work is done. And Teddy Roosevelt, an Army veteran, San Juan Hill, Colonel, Rough Riders himself, as our president, Nobel, Nobel Prize, Nobel Award recipient himself, Teddy Roosevelt said it is character. He said character is the most defining attribute in an individual and in a nation. So my thanks tonight is to Tom and to Janet and to Amy and to everybody here for reminding us and for instilling character, that character does count, and if not me, then who? For what you do with our high school recipients, for Kyle, for Dominic, for Brianna, all three of whom we're incredibly proud of. And I really meant, even though I said no pressure, it is pressure. I expect you to be leaders because you've already shown you have the right stuff. You've already stepped forward when everybody else stepped back. And I know you'll do it because I know the drive and the pressure comes from within. And we're incredibly proud of you. And for the 11 families here who are our Gold Star families, be they wives, mothers, fiancés, parents, thank you for putting your costly sacrifice on the altar of freedom and then for stepping back and taking that really hard, deep breath to say, I can still give myself. I can honor him or her, I can cherish the memory, but I can let him or her live through me and my actions and the things that I believe in. Former Commandant, now the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs, good friend of mine, Joe Dunford, says, you know, you got to have a dream in order to have a dream come true. And I admire the Mannion Foundation for having a dream and for working energetically, tirelessly to have that dream come true. I thank the corporate sponsors here tonight. I thank the individual sponsors here tonight. And I thank those role models and exemplars who have either benefited from working with the foundation, who, who give their time and talent to the foundation. You make a difference. My last quote tonight is from Abraham Lincoln again. He says, America, when Americans cease to be good, America will cease to be great. We do indeed, despite the trials and travails that you see on the evening news, despite the challenges you'll see with policy downrange, we all know in our heart of hearts, we live in the greatest nation on the face of the earth. And we know that we're the shining beacon on the hill that everybody else wants to be like. In our heart of hearts, we're gonna keep working to make sure that what they wanna be like is what, what we wanna become, that we're gonna really give the best example. So on behalf of the United States Marine Corps, I'm honored and privileged to be with you tonight to represent part of that one half of 1%, to represent part of that next generation, 
to thank you all for your support for the Travis Mannion Foundation, your leadership of the foundation, and tell you all, God bless you and Semper Fidelis.